my idea of change in this world is not about getting more stuff or becoming richer or even su successful in the terms that society understands it nowadays. My vision of, of uh, improving the world is to change our lifestyle where we require less, less from, from the environment, less from the world, where we do not need to spew carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from our activities or from the junk that we buy or from the work that we do for that matter. I grew up mostly in Mexico City up till I was about 16. I ran my own business at that time. I was uh, delivering vegetables and fruits to the moms of my friends. I knew nothing about growing crops, but I I guess because I didn't know anything, I thought it was a good, a great idea, and so I went and did it. I lost all my savings promptly, but I traded that for a love of the land. It uh, changed my life. I didn't go back to Mexico City after that. Well, specifically after we moved to Hiko, me and my family, um, we got together with some friends that uh, we had known in uh, an environmental movement. Uh, we, there used to be campouts and, and sweat lodges and uh, workshops uh, all focused in, in environment. And when we moved to Hiko, we met with them and uh, we had this idea of buying land together. And so we started looking, uh, people were offering me land constantly, and uh, we found a pretty good sized property and a very affordable price. Here's what we see in the background over there. That's uh, that forest that we see back there. It used to be a pasture not more than 15 years ago. Our main focus was conservation from the beginning. It's something we we talked about and we agreed on. That's the, the most important focus of purchasing that property, is just let it grow, let the forest grow. And I realized that nature knows what to do to heal itself. And in terms of reforestation, in this region specifically, I don't think there's a more effective way or inexpensive at it than letting it be and letting it do it. So, Yes, reintroduce some trees that you're interested in, especially if you want to harvest eventually, but that's about it. Now, some of the forest you see is a subsequent purchase of property by a family of one of the partners in the, in the original purchase. And they were very impressed at the growth of the forest in, in that original purchase, so much so that they decided to buy the adjacent property. And it was totally pasture. I remember well when they went to visit, they had just finished chopping everything. There was a few big trees here and there, of course. But that was it. And as you can see, it, it just grew back. And that part of the forest is younger yet than the original property that we purchased. The grass areas have become minimal. There's a few pasture areas in, in that property. Everything turned to forest, everything else. There's a lot of water. There's several springs and a stream that runs through it. And uh, the forest just grew back. We let it be. We stopped uh, putting cows in there because they used to have cows previously and the forest just basically grew back again in a very quick manner. Very impressive. You don't require much to live in the forest. Entertainment is, is just part of the, of the everyday lifestyle of regular activities. It's one of the most fun experiences I've had in my life. Even as a family, when we lived here in, in the Gomes, I, uh, my whole family remembers it as one of the most 
enjoyable and enduring experiences they have they look back to this time as some of the best time in their life they've told me my kids have told me that and that tells me that tells me that definitely it's worth pursuing so our plan is to do that we're gonna keep making cheese and we're gonna keep making chocolate but we want to minimize our carbon footprint and our impact in the world and just uh, learn and, and be able to develop a, a lifestyle that is, works here to, in, in the forest and be able to offer that to other people to, to teach it and to welcome people to try it out. I don't want to depend on food that has to travel halfway around the world to get to my plate. I, I don't think that's right in terms of carbon emissions and in terms of food security it's terrible any time that system gets disrupted which i believe will happen sooner rather than later could be a weather disaster or a financial disaster or the lack of fossil fuels or god knows what one will be in a terrible bind to feed oneself and one's family. One is dependent on the grocery store to provide for food, food for the table. So I feel that it's really basic in terms of a long-term survival. And I'm not gonna say just survival, but development of a sustainable, a regen regenerative culture. And I believe nowadays there's very few people that live like that, very few and very few people that depend on natural systems to exist, exist as a community or exist as a culture. I look to the indigenous cultures for inspiration on that. Indigenous cultures, they didn't industrialize. They lived in, in mostly in some kind of balance with the environment and that's why they kept living for thousands of years and kept cultures long living cultures for all that time we all want the same thing we all want to be healthy we all want our families to be healthy we all want uh, to be happy and our families to be happy I think it actually breaks down to simple formulas I personally believe we're being scammed by the industrial system I think it's a uh, fantasy that things are better or easier when one is uh, hooked and dependent on the industrial system I think it's they just programmed us through education and media to believe that's the best way to live in fact when you think about first world countries a lot of the culture they export has to do with that. Buy more stuff. Buy, consume more stuff, spend more energy, whether moving around or through electronics or travel abroad or whatnot. I call that mental colonization. the group, the original purchasers of that property got together, we're all acquaintances and friends and we had a common vision and we basically started to put that common vision into paper. We started writing down our agreements and we followed a protocol that was thanks to somebody that was experienced on, on uh, doing this type of things. And we decided that we would form a non-profit organization to uh, transfer the property title to. We figured that eventually we, any of us could die and we're all going to die. And we wanted to make sure that there was not going to be future problems with, uh, with inheritance and people becoming involved that wouldn't have the same focus as, as, the, as the original owners. 
we decided on two levels of membership in the nonprofit. The one level we call it active members. And the, the, the active members, they have a right to vote on decisions and, of course, the obligation to show up. And then we have a different level of membership, which we call it honorary members. And that's the members, the people that are also involved in the original land purchase, but that are not within the region and that cannot be directly involved at the meetings. And the honorary membership also allows for people that want to be involved in the, in the project that may not want to put money into it or may not want to be fully involved in, uh, as a full member, as an active member, but that would like to offer ideas, that would like to uh, make contacts uh, with uh, other organizations, etc., etc., and that, uh, that space is allowed through the honorary membership also. Find us at our Facebook page, which is Teyoapa, T-E-Y-O-A-P-A. And you'll see pictures of the farm, the animals, some of the family, etc. And we also have a website called teyoapa.com or .org. That's going to be the easiest way to contact us.